Good afternoon, everyone. I am Thomas Schalke, and I'm going to be <coughs> doing my best to moderate this session. And the way uh, Brian and the organizing committee set this up, if you look at your plan of this one, uh, Mr. Doug is going to be talking about burn plan writing, and it's actually going to be two sessions. So if by chance you choose or have to leave, you know, you're not, you're not handcuffed or, or stationed in your chair, bathroom, etc. Just, just be cordial about it and, and don't block anybody and, and try to stay quiet. But I'll give the floor to Mr. Doug. He's going to be here until about 1.50. He said it might run a little shorter. Perfectly fine. But uh, feel free to, to quietly get up as, as need be or go to your next session. Thank you all very much for being here. Thank you for that great introduction. Um, it's like we're still getting rearranged a little bit, but yeah, that's fine. So how many folks here have been on a prescribed burn? Okay, that's quite a few. How many have written burn plans? That's still a few. <coughs> so I want to tell you a little story about uh, my burn plan writing experience. Uh, one of the first uh, plans I ever wrote uh, about 2000, back in about 2000, I was working for the Nature Conservancy and uh, we had a, a project over called the Graves Ranch out in the Panhandle where we had blowout pensamon, which is an endangered species. And so I've been out there for a couple of days actually going out and counting the plants, which is one of my annual duties, and came from the Panhandle of Nebraska to over north of Gothenburg uh, to boss a demonstration burn for the prescribed burn task force which was basically a bunch of volunteers came in took a class and wanted to come out and do a burn <clears throat> so i came out that morning you know it's a couple hour drive uh, in so i came driving in got into the unit that was mark albert's unit north of gothenburg and uh, looked at at what the burn plan was and, and the equipment we had we had 18 people uh, there was a tractor with a thousand gallon water tank, two AT fees with sprayers, and the rest was hand tools. So <clears throat> it's not a lot of equipment compared to what most people would use today. I looked at the burn plan, it called for uh, burning around three think, pockets of cedar trees about 15 feet tall on a 45 degree slope and about 2,000 pounds per acre of little and big blue stem and no mowed line, no anything. So I don't know if you, how familiar you guys are with that, but it wasn't doable with the people and the, the equipment we had. So basically Mark and I jumped on his ATV, uh, went running around and he owned the pasture there. And so we laid out the burn unit that day. The limitations were on the south. Yeah, if you don't mind doing that, appreciate that. I think that's just that area right there. Yes, yeah, so convert this to this. Go ahead. To this. Go ahead. Using this. Go ahead. So, our our NGLC's approach is a multi-level approach. We want to work with local landowners, volunteer fire departments, and partners to. Drive fire into the local culture. So, develop landscape specific techniques and strategies. We write burn plans when our partners are unable to do so. We've got some really good partners to help write these. Serve as burn boss to implement successful burns. To achieve landscape scale impacts. Now we'll talk about how we're going to plan these burns. <coughs> so, Initially, your objectives should be long term, and, and the first objective is that should be a whole range of plan. You know, instead of just writing out, I want to burn this unit, let's go make a plan for these 400 acres or a thousand acres or whatever it is. We want to do bring your whole ranch into the operation. And what you want to ask yourself some questions Is fire fit into my operation? Is it the appropriate tool to use? Do I have the resources or contacts? If you guys have been watching and listening, like, like Jim Jenkins this morning, I've been working with him for several years, you have to have the capacity to pull off the burn or know somebody that does. Making a burn plan, 
it, it doesn't do. There's people that really get into this, as lots of NRCS people know. You know, let's go burn. Okay, good idea. They get it burned, but they don't have any idea. So if you don't have a way to implement it, you need to you need to think about that before you get into commit to a burn. <laughs> so what are my long-term objectives? Number one should be establish a grazing fire rotation for the entire operation. And something like quantify and eliminate 100% of the cedars from my whole. So there's other other things, wildlife goals or or grass-related management goals, but these are some of them. This is sort of an example of, of beginning a maybe a ranch plan. You'll have the middle unit, west unit, and the northeast prairie unit. Start thinking about you know how you're going to develop your ranch to set up your rotational burn or your burn. Rotation. The advantage of this is that you can manage grazing to prepare for a bird. You can leave enough fuel in the pasture you're going to burn to achieve your objective. If it's kill cedar trees, you're going to need some fuel, 2,000, 2,500 pounds per acre minimum. You can also graze your bordering pastures, graze them down so that you don't have the, the escape or the uh, potential for slop overs or spot fires. You know, at least minimize that. <coughs> Manage rotation to minimize prep by if you have a line, you have to put in a line here and cut trees out, you know, build a road or whatever you've got to do, then you will have one for the unit right next to it. So that line's already prepared. So rather than putting over here and over here and over here, you can sequentially manage those units so your lines, you don't have to do those lines every year. Every year. Facilitate early sign up for government cost shares. And I think again, the NRCS or whoever is, is uh, providing that will really appreciate that. You get people coming in, uh, you know, on February. I want to burn in April on CRP or whatever, and you know, that really doesn't work that well. It takes a year or so's lead time. So if you've got your ranch management in place, you've already got that set up. That worked for it. A rancher named John Maddox, some of you may know him, but he's, he's clear out in the Juanita area, western Nebraska, and he's got all of this laid out for a year. <laughs> I mean, he's a far thinking guy, and he's got, you know, he's got his, all of his programs figured out where he's going to do what. A really good example, and a very successful, very successful rancher. But that's how he, you know, that's how he does it. It also gives you adequate retracts for a unit. Line to burn. Again, it takes a long time to get ready to do one of these burns in the families. And people come in and in February and say, I want to burn in April or March. It doesn't happen. It takes a year. I'd much rather have a remote than a freshman. <laughs> we'll do it. We'll deal with what we got, I guess. <clears throat> so then you want short term. So you have your long term objectives, and you want to, need to set up some short term objectives. And these need to be quantifiable, they need to be realistic, they need to be measurable, and they need to be specific. So eliminate 60% of the mature cedars from the burn unit. You know, that's a quantifiable, it's doable, that's a really good objective for your first burn. Um, increase season grasses by 30%, decrease cool, grease, cool season grasses, you can do uh, increase forbs by, you know, this, this kind of percent, but put some numbers on it. Make sure it's doable and make sure it's quantifiable. Okay, setting objectives allows you to prepare your burn parameters or to think about your burn parameters. You can determine the kind of burn you need, uh, the time of year, you know, is it a fall burn, is it a spring burn, is it a summer burn, it would best achieve these objectives. If I've got CRP and I want to knock back the big, the big warm so I can get my forbs coming in, then you need to know when, to, when that timing is. So if you have your objectives, you can burn that in July. You know, if you want to kill cedar trees, uh, but you don't want to do a dormant season burn, or I mean a, a growing season burn, which, you know, John Weir is a big proponent and it works, but if you want to try to do that, you know, during your, your dormant season or your traditional spring um, <clears throat> time burn, which is only usually burn to kill cedar trees, you know, then you need to know that and what kind of intensity. Am I killing 30 foot cedar trees? Am I killing one foot cedar trees? You know, can I do it with a backfire? Do I need to do a modified ring fire with interior ignition and stuffing and cutting, you know, or cutting and stuffing? So this helps you to decide what parameters you need and that kind of, the kind of burn, the burn intensity, that kind of thing tells you how many people do you need? 
You know, it takes a lot more people to do a thousand acre canyon burn in the springtime when you're killing 30 foot cedar trees than it does to do a thousand acre CRP burn, you know, in, the, in July if you got some disc lines and, and you want to just knock that back a little bit. So the size of the crew, how much equipment, same way, you know, you're going to need more equipment to do the more difficult burns. What kind of ignition pattern? Can I do this with just a backfire? Do I need to do modified, uh, you know, modified ring, you know, like I said, with, in with interior ignition? Weather parameters, you know, what's my relative humidity? What's my wind speed? What's my air temperature? And that's one thing we can talk about here in the Great Plains. You know, when I learned to burn, it did a lot of wildfire suppression out in, in, in uh, the West, you know, in California, uh, Oregon, all, you know, all those out there, totally different. But when I started learning how to burn, you know, uh, do some prescribed fire, Pat Shaver was, was one of the NRCS uh, leads at that time and he can't he uses the 80 20 20 rule now that works in certain areas it works pretty well in the Great Plains that means uh, you guys who's ever heard of the 80 20 20 rule okay that means you don't burn at over 80 degrees uh, you don't burn under 20 percent relative humidity and you don't burn over 20 miles per hour now you know that doesn't work everywhere that just works in certain areas and as we saw maybe they were talking about that yesterday I think Drock or or John or some of those guys, um, if you have, you know, you can exceed, even in the Midwest, you can exceed those parameters. You know, I, I personally have not done it and probably won't. <laughs> but, you know, there are conditions where you can do that, particularly if you're going to do a summer burn. You've got to do away with that 80 degrees because it's going to be a lot warmer and that's going to limit your kill. So, but the 80-20-20, as far as the, as far as those, um, the relative humidity, you know, once it gets below 20% relative humidity in this landscape, your spot fires goes up exponentially. Uh, UNL, John Weir, he, or you, um, New Mexico, or not New Mexico, Oklahoma State, John Weir, they, I looked at some studies that he did as far as spot fires. They actually, you know, changed these parameters or picked different days, different relative humidities and set things on fire and measured how far the spot fires went. And they found down to 25%, they did not get a lot of spot fires. From 25 to 20%, they increased quite a bit. And below 20, he said, you're guaranteed to get spot fires. So they know that's something you need to know if you're gonna be burning. And that's how we set that 20% parameter in the 80-20-20 rule. Wind speed, minimum is five. You know, you have to have something to give you a direction. If it's less than five, you've got light and variable and you don't know what's gonna happen. And your topography really takes over, you know, your wind. So it'll run uphill a lot faster, which it goes uphill anyway, but, so less than five, you know, it's five to 20 in this landscape. And over 20, I mean, I've been out there 15 mile an hour, you know, true wind speed on the ground, that's scary. You're going, why am I dropping this match? You know, that's plenty of wind. And you can burn up to 20, that's 20 foot wind speed, but uh, you know, that's measured at 20 feet in the air and it's a little bit less that on the ground, but still that's, that's a lot of wind. So, you know, if you are gonna burn over that, you know, you, know, you better, better cock your hammer because it's gonna get Western in this area. Air temperature, we talked a little bit about that. You know, that's not something I worry that much about. Even in the spring, I don't see that that makes a lot of difference. It obviously warms your fuels and makes them more, uh, more volatile, but <clears throat> especially if you're gonna do a, a uh, growing season burn and 80 is not a good parameter to have, you're probably gonna just either eliminate that or at least raise it quite a bit. So that's something to think about. Uh, fuel load, that's another thing. Do I have a heavy fuel load? Do I have a light fuel load? You know, that's going to dictate what sort of ignition you have, what sort of people and trucks you need. You know, if you've got you know, 3,000 pounds per acre versus 1,500 pounds per acre, two very different animals. Most things, most times you'll have uh, a very, you know, a variation of, it's not very, unless you're doing a CRP, it's usually not very um, homogeneous. It's usually pretty different fuel loads in different areas. Okay. Burn unit layout. Um, one of the things you want to think about is you want to look at your smoke hazards. You don't want to put smoke on airports, hospitals, major highways. So when you're laying out your burn unit and picking your wind direction, you want to make sure those things are not downwind. You need to pick a different wind direction. You know, you can't put smoke on those things. 
Uh, natural barriers, again, especially you know, in the Los Canyons is where I've done quite a bit of burning and writing burn plans for. You don't want to drop a blade. All right, Brent? What happens when you drop a blade in the Los Canyons? You get, a, you get a canyon. Yeah, I mean, it's erosion is bad, so you try not to do any mineral soil. You know, we don't, we do a lot of, I think John had some stuff yesterday about how much Nebraska does with wet lining, and it's a lot because we don't, you know, we don't do mineral soil. You know, we don't make mineral soil very often unless we have to. We like to use roads, um, creek bottoms, you know, ridge tops, wide, wider the better. Um, <clears throat> you try not to cross these canyons, but you're going to have to at some point. If you, you know, if you do one of these burns, you're going to have to cross a canyon. And so we'll get into some of the things we can do when we talk about that. But use your natural barriers where possible. Again, roads, creeks, you know, and, and those aren't bulletproof. So that's where we start putting in our, our line. And then you, we use what I call live black line that moves. You light your fire, you use a wet line, and it moves off and creates that basically the fire removes the fuel to create that wider line as you go. Uh, consider topography, type, fuel load when you put in your lines. You know, you want your lines to be as straight as they can be. Uh, you don't want them angling down a, a hillside. You don't want them going, you know, if you've got a hill like this, you don't want to put your line in the middle of the hill because you've got fire pushing your line all the time and you've got stuff rolling down the hill. So put it on the tops, put it on the bottoms. If you go down a hill, go straight down. You don't, don't angle it down. Go straight down and then straight back up the other side. Uh, fuel load, obviously, if you can miss putting it through a bunch of cedar trees where you have to do a bunch of prep, you got a heavy fuel. If you can miss putting it through, you know, grass this tall, put it somewhere where it's light. Make it easy. You know, make it easy. Use that's that's a good rule of thumb is keep it simple and make it easy on yourself. Try to back up. You know, you don't have to gun go right next to the unit. If you can back up and use these features, back up as far as you need to. You know, get some other landowners involved and make it bigger. And get on the roads, get on the ridge tops, you know, get on the canyon bottoms. <clears throat> Again, avoid heavy fuels, rough terrain, crossing canyons, side hills, or vehicle access. You know, we use vehicles almost exclusively uh, on these burns. They're big. You know, they're a lot of miles of perimeter. And you know, if you're out there with a hand tool on foot, you're going to get left behind, and you're going to be kind of insignificant for most of the burn, unless you can really hoof it fast. You know, you can't run down a spot fire if you're on foot. So. We need vehicle access. We try to get engines all the way around. Uh, if not, for sure, UTVs or ATVs. Sometimes you have to come to a serious crossing. You cannot get stuff across. Uh, we'll back an engine up on one side, the other side, you know, drop hoses down and just, so when you're wet lining, you come down, you know, this engine ties in and, and then this one just picks up and takes some clear up the other side. This engine either goes into patrol mode or, or finds a way to relocate and come around and, and tie back into that crew. But you got to think ahead on all that stuff. You know, that's why you look your, uh, walk your line and look ahead so you can pre-plan. You know, you can't just do that on flight. Oh no, there's a canyon. What am I going to do? You know, it, it's a little bit late when you've got, you know, 2,000 acres or 1,000 or 100 acres on fire behind you. <clears throat> so again, walk or drive the entire unit so you know. Don't just guess looking at the map. So you know that you can get vehicles and where your problems are. One of the things that I did when I first started laying these canyon uh, units out, I would walk you know, and pretend like I was lighting a drip torch, had a truck in front of me laying down a wet line in your mind and walk that entire perimeter. And that way you see what the hazards are. You know, I'm, I'm running here, I'm putting fire, dictating this, this terrain, this weather. I'm going to have a wind. I know what my wind direction is going to be. So what's that fire going to do? If I get over here, there's a hill and I put fire here, it's going to run up that hill. You know, the wind's coming this way. It's going to push that right across in front of me and my truck. So if you've got a truck ahead of you, you see something like that, something that we call, I call extended wet line, send that truck ahead, you lay down that wet line before you start up that hill, well before you start up the hill. Maybe have an ATV come back and support you as you go up with your torch. But like I said, you come over a hill and go, oh no, there's a hill, it's too late by <laughs> And you've got fire behind you, and it's gonna go up that hill whether you do or not. So you gotta think ahead, walk that, 
mark that on your map. You know, I've got a hill here, I'm gonna have to do something special so you can think ahead of time. If you need to pre-position an engine on top of that hill and run a hose down, you know, do that, you know, then you're there. But, so uh, walk or drive the entire unit, um, identify and map all hazards, special circumstances, just like we're talking about. <clears throat> Mitigate undrivable portions of the line with engine relocation, hose lays, hand crews. I know I can't get an engine down, but I know I can drop some people with tools. You know, even if I can't get the hose all the way down there, I can put some tool guys down there. We'll light that. We'll put this out with, with tools and we'll pick it up on the other side. So planning ahead is critical. Locate the perimeter to allow safe ignition with as many wind directions as possible. Now that opens up your prescription. You have a prescription <coughs> when you light a plan based on the, the, the weather parameters. Wind direction is one of them. If you pick a south wind and that's all you pick and you get a whole bunch of north winds, but there's no good reason to pick a south wind, then you're wasting a lot of burn days. And we don't have a lot of burn days. You know, we get eight to 10 in the spring in this country. So you don't want to squander a birthday or a burn day by having too narrow of a, of a window. But on the other hand, you want to make it safe. You know, if you've got some issues that you can't burn that direction, then, then you can't burn that direction. You know, there's always a better, usually a better uh, wind direction to pick, but try to make, put your, put your perimeter so you can burn with more than one wind direction. Yeah. Identify interior ignition routes as needed. You know, if you do interior ignition, the guys that are in there, they know what they're doing. They're kind of gonna, you know, you don't, you know, you can draw some lines in there. They'll follow them or not. You know, I mean, this is, it's like, it's like anything else. Once fire hits the ground, the best laid plan goes out the window and you have to improvise. And you need the plan, but you also have to be flexible to be able to, because the weather is gonna change and a lot of things can change. You have to have the flexibility and that's the burn boss to be able to change to match those conditions. <clears throat> you need to identify your escape routes and your safety zones and put them on your burn map so people know where those are. You know, those are things that are less flammable, something around a, a stock tank where there's some dirt stomped out, you know, plowed field, road, just wherever fire won't really, you know, won't carry across. Identify your access point, gates, etc. You have to know how to get in and out, especially if you've got vehicles, <clears throat> you know, you have to know where you can get them. You know, one of the best things is to have some wire cutters on your vehicles and you can make your gate, you know, because you really need that. You know, if you have any kind of an issue, you need to be able to go where you need to go. Okay, weather parameters, we talked about that. It depends on where you're burning, the 80, 20, 20. Um, yeah, this is, and, and they talked about this a little bit yesterday, but you know, in Nevada, this doesn't work at all. You know, there, you, you don't ever get that much relative humidity. And if you did, it wouldn't burn at that. So this 80, 20, 20 is pretty well, uh, the Great Plains, it works pretty well for that. But again, you're, it won't fit every scenario and you need the flexibility to know that when you write that into your plan. So if you're, you know, if you're working in a different part of the country, you will have a different set of rules. Okay, go ahead. So if you start with a good burn map, that's the way I always said, go out and look at the unit, put in your burn map with those considerations. Go ahead. <clears throat> this one's an old one. It's pretty kind of complicated, but um, one thing I always do, you know, you, you have to name your teams. You have an ignition sequence and it names your teams. Sometimes people call team one, team two, you know, whatever you want to call it. To me, keep it simple, team east, team west. We usually have a north-south wind component. So we'll have an east team and a west team. That way I don't have to think. Let's see, is team two, is that, is that west team or is that east team? You know, if you're in the, in the moment, you can not remember that. Don't want to have to dig in your pocket and find your, your roster or your map to, to see that. So I always name them Team East, Team West. This one's a little more complicated uh, and I don't have a pointer, but had a canyon coming through here. So, you know, we need to burn down to this both ways. Um, I don't remember exactly what all the parameters are, but we had it. So we had a Team Southeast, Southwest, two ignition points. You know, one comes up this way, uh, one comes down here. They tie in the middle and when they get this done. They relocate to other places or go on patrol. This particular unit had uh, some pretty nasty stuff right in here. And 
you, know, you need your fire to back into your unit. Ignition point here, you get your black going in here. And so we had people on foot, a couple of people, not that many, but just go in and, and light this up so you get that black going. Otherwise, you might sit there for a really long time while that fire creeps into the wind, you know, if you don't have a very good fuel, if you don't have things. So you can go in there and widen that out. Um, we have uh, our spotters. You know, this is where we anticipate um, some spot fires if they're going to happen in the blue area. Uh, again, that's totally situationally dependent to where you put those as to exactly where that wind's coming. Uh, that wind will be here. We got north, and if it comes out of the north, it could go northeast to northwest. To, you know, it, it goes back and forth all day long. It doesn't usually stay in one particular direction. We got power lines. You know, we got our safety zones. We got our spotters. We have our ignition people, um, ATV ignition, and here we have points marked on each side of that map. You know, A, B, C. So you can say, well, when team East is at number two, Team West should be at B, you know, try to keep those. So you're not just guessing as to where you're at on that map if you don't have some pretty good um, landmarks and at least you know, you know, put, and put those marks where you can find out either side of that fence or, you know, up here you can usually see each other's smoke, but this tells you uh, more precisely, you know, to keep your teams together because coordination and communication are really, really important on these big landscape scale uh, burns. <clears throat> so now we have an official burn plan. We're going to get ready. Now NRCS, um, if you're seeking cost share, you can use an NRCS burn plan. Uh, I would, you, you'll need to, to tie in with an NRCS agent of some kind or Pheasants Forever to get these kind of burn plans written. They're pretty complicated. They're pretty long. Uh, Jeff, what do you, any input on that? Correct, and, but they, and they do require a lot of extra maps that a lot of the other plans don't require. Yeah, that, that's one thing, it depends what you're doing for. Those extra maps are only required for the TSPs. Okay. Um, the, extra, the other maps and all that are already in the NRCS case files, so you don't have to have all those maps with the burn plan unless you're a TSP. Do you know how accessible are there? Is there a place online they can go and get a hold of them? Okay. So go in and see your, if you're not an employee, then go in and see your, your local NRCS person and they can get a hold of one of these for you. Otherwise, we have, uh, we have the Cowboys, uh, one more, versus the Huskers or whoever, Kansas. Every, all the extension agents have a pretty good um, checklist. They have a pretty good plan. You can go in and follow that plan down uh, if you want to write your plan. And again, there, a lot of that stuff is is questions that are answered ahead of time or things to think about checklists. So in Nebraska, and again, this is more site specific, you have to have a burn permit uh, because Nebraska is constantly under a burn ban by the state law. So the burn permit is an exception to that state law. Uh, they are granted by each volunteer fire department. Each fire chief has the ability to grant that. And so you need to get your plan, you know, and take it in to the local volunteer fire department and get them to uh, look at that permit or to get a permit from them to, is the exception to that burn ban. Now, I'll tell you, when we, were, when we are writing a plan, and there's another little story, um, it's important, even on the simple CRP plans, you think this is a really straightforward burn, a straightforward plan. Uh, we had an example here, in, or an, an, an incident in Nebraska that some folks said I had worked with before. I wrote them a burn plan. Um, they went with the volunteer fire department. They all CRP, straightforward. They burned it and went really well, had a great year. 
Uh, the next year they came in for another one and I was working with a guy that had just started. So I was a state burn specialist at the time. Uh, so he wrote the burn plan and I went through it with him very meticulously because it was his first one, but very simple CRP. You know, it should have been uh, cut and dried. So we made sure it was, it was pretty specked out. Uh, long story short, they did not follow the burn plan. They violated some of the things that were the parameters in there, including the relative humidity and some other things. And three people were burned to death. So uh, that was a, you know, it was a major incident. And that plan went clear to Washington, D.C. to be reviewed. I went down and, and went to the incident and, and investigated and talked to some different people and found out what was going on. And they were in some violation of a lot of things. But that just goes to show you every plan is important. And every word in that plan, make sure all of those uh, I's are dotted and those T's are crossed because you never know. And once you write that plan, you are responsible for that. And you never know what's going to come out when you give that to somebody else. So make sure you do your due diligence. What they do with that is up to them. But a good lesson right there is don't ever take anything for granted, no matter how simple you think it is. You know, make sure it's right. So again, print and save the latest weather forecast. And this is, you know, this is going kind of back to that 80-20-20, which is what I've worked under. Uh, if your forecast, if you, know, you go, you live and die by what's on that piece of paper. Whatever it's doing on the ground or whatever you're measuring, that really doesn't matter. It's what your latest forecast says. And if you're out of prescription, if, you're, if your plan says 25% relative humidity and it's 20, or, or predicted to be 20 any time during your burn period, don't drop the match. Same with the wind. You know, it's easy to say, well, it's, it's only going to 21, you know, but if, you're, if your parameter is 20 and it, goes to, and it says 21, uh, you know, you're out of prescription. So you're responsible for that and, and you lose all of your protection if you burn outside those parameters that are on that burn plan. So print that, take it to the burn, you know, and if it's out of prescription, don't be afraid to not drop the match. You know, that's, that's the hardest thing not to do. But you get 40 people and a bunch of equipment there and they're all ready to go. And it's like, man, I, we can't go. <laughs> you, know, you make that call before you show up normally. You'll get it on the phone or, or emails or texts or you know, whatever, whatever system you have is it's a go, no-go call. But you know, if it's out of prescription, don't drop the match. So here's one that's uh, sort of an anatomy of a burn. It's a little bit complicated, but this is the plan that we were looking at here. We've got, I mean, we've got, the, we've got the black knocked in here on the downwind. We've got the backfire moving in, and we're bringing up the flanks. You know, the wind's coming in this way. Right. Thanks, team. <laughs> okay, I got ten more minutes. I better, I better hurry. Okay, <laughs> okay. Anyway, we got we got fire coming up this way, and this is going to be a, a little bit complicated because I thought it's going to have a remote. So one thing about when you're bringing fire up the flanks, you're setting a flank fire and moving into these bigger units. A lot of times, it might be downhill. You know, in that much fuel, they don't go very fast. So one of the techniques we kind of evolved was to set some strip head fires. You take somebody out here either on a bike or on foot bring them in and then that black comes down and cleans that out. It also kills more trees because it's a lot more aggressive fire. It's a mini set of mini head fires. So that's when we call them strip head fires. Go ahead. Run in this, go ahead. Run in the strip head fires. They start filling in the unit. Uh, we bring them up at each side. Okay, then your black, as you get your downwind black in, nice and black, you've got a pretty big area. You've got a nice set of of black on each side and that's important because when this wind comes down here north wind of some kind it'll hit this canyon and it'll come over this way it'll hit this canyon it'll go that way so it goes three directions at any given time it really does i mean go in there and, and uh, especially if you're doing interior ignition you can really see some hairy stuff in there um it just depends on your terrain you know you never really want to light go uphill with after you light because it's going to chase you out of the unit so you try to light from the outside in you know and, and as people get more experience they sometimes light that way and then come back and bring when you got to be a little careful you know but yeah don't light ever going uphill and <laughs> put fire behind you because it's going to chase you up the hill and i've never been able to outrun it so yeah don't light don't light uh 
don't like going uphill. Um, so anyway, keep going. So we've got our we've got our black knocked in. So we start doing a little interior ignition. We've usually got ATVs that come in here, uh, sometimes on foot. Again, they have to really coordinate with these guys uh, because they light a fire that can come here or they light a fire that can come cut these guys off. So it takes a lot of coordination. It's not boilerplate. You can't say you got to do this. You, you got to read it. You got to read the weather. You got to read the terrain. And these got to be experienced people that can operate ATVs and some pretty nasty stuff or on foot. So yeah, just keep going slowly. So we just bring it up, interior fills in. Keep bring, bringing your strip head fires to clean up those sides. <clears throat> As your black moves forward again, you just keep moving. So that's what it kind of looks like. And the reason we do that is because um, we first started doing this, just did a modified ring fire. You might, can you back that up one? Yeah, that's good right there. We just did a modified ring and maybe have one guy had one ATV go up a canyon and put some interior because it looked like a good thing to do. Um, but we were really getting spotty. You know, it doesn't even close, especially a big rougher unit. It'll kind of go burn here and skip around. You don't really get that heat source. Now, if you're familiar with the grass ring fire, you know how that all pulls together at the end and everything comes up and you get a lot of heat. That works on this. You know, if you get enough heat in the middle, it'll actually pull that in. So by doing interior and they do cutting and stuffing is as you cut some of the trees and then you stuff them in the canyons, that really builds that heat up uh, because that fuel's a little bit uneven as well. You cut off those north faces or those bottoms and you stuff them, and you set those piles on fire, it, it really gets that center heat going pulls that whole thing together and it makes it wind that comes in. So it really improves your kill. We went from 30% kill to over 90 on almost all of the burns if you have decent parameters just by doing that. So anyway, so this is the end. You leave, a, you know, you leave an escape route for the guys on the interior. Um, you know, I've done a lot of interior. You don't necessarily, a lot of times it's safer just to find a, a low spot in the fuel or a green valley or a, you know, a tank that's got livestock stomping and you wait and go back through and get in the black because you know the black is safe so you can go through find a place to go through here and wait or you go out the other end so are we done yeah so that's kind of the anatomy of that burn and any questions get one more of those anybody have any questions on burn plan burning you know it's kind of a quick and dirty but um, How do you specify? Yeah, you'll have, and that's one thing I kind of missed in that, uh, was you will have an ignition sequence that will detail, you know, we have team A, it's got this amount of people on it. Team B has got like an engine, two engines, you know, and then these, team, these guys will go this way, these guys will go this way, and that's some of the things that we talked about, um, looking at for those parameters as they go around that unit. But yeah, there will be a, a definite ignition sequence that defines exactly what each team does and then there will be a, a team roster and those should be in those burn plans that has you know how many trucks you know how many gallons how many people and that's when you're writing those you definitely want to make sure that you write those for a minimum you need to have enough to be safe but you don't want to overwrite them because that burn plan if you say you have to have 45 people and nine engines then you have to have 45 people and nine engines because if you don't then you're out of prescription so you want to write them with the minimum people and equipment that you can have but you don't want to cut it so that it's not safe you can always take more you know if you, you can write it for for 25 if that's the minimum but if you know you can take 100 if they show up so you know, this is what's something that uh, with volunteers you don't know how many you're going to get so you write it with a minimum uh, but make sure it's safe, and then you can take whatever you need. And then you have a detailed ignition sequence that says, you know, we travel along, Team East goes this way, and Team West goes this way, and it, and it details just what we went through with that map, you know, exactly how you do that. That's something we kind of missed out of that. Yeah, I think it's important. I 
never heard anybody touch on the fact that you need radio communication between your spotter right. and your left and right flank. Right. And the interior and the burn bus, you need really good radio communication, particularly with, you know, when you're doing interior ignition, they need to really be in communication with the exterior and the burn boss. And the burn boss does not have to be in on every one of those conversations. You know, usually the, the flank leaders will talk to the interior or they will talk to the exterior igniters. You mentioned that in Nebraska, y'all have a permitting system. Mm -hmm. Who all can apply for permits? How, how far in advance do you have to apply and how long are those permits good for? Anybody can apply. You know, if you if you want to get a burn, if you want to burn something in your a half an acre in your backyard, you have to have a permit. So you just go apply, and it just depends on the on the fire department. Some people will give them to you the same day. It's nice to give them some lead time, and they can also write it for you know up to a week or two weeks or one day. So it's pretty much up to the fire chief what they write those for. Yeah, uh, this is more of like a technical question. Like, what's the average time it takes from like forming up? To form a plan. Um, the time it, I mean, you, you, probably a month or two. You know, if you go out, it depends on how. If you're going to go out and you're going to really research that, walk it, or you know, you can do it in a week if you want to. But it just depends on how much. But in, in, how much? Um, if how much preparation otherwise it may be even up to a year you know if you're going to do a lot of cutting and preparing you should probably start developing that plan and then you know as you're doing that so you know where to do the cutting and the preparing i hope that answered that i wasn't Yes, you can do it with any wind direction. That was just for that specific plan. You know, that was because that was the that was the demographic that we wanted to use. You know, we wanted to run it to the south because it made it, it would it would burn that unit better and and it was a little more difficult to hold on the other end. So you can write it for any wind direction. You know, you kind of look at your unit and see what your most defensible sides are, or like I said, highways or anything like that. If you don't want to put smoke or anything on them, then you want to write it to go the other direction. So you can pick any wind you want. Or if you can, you, you can develop your plan so you can go with e wind either way, that's even better. You know. right, are there any other questions for Mr. Dev? All right, let's give him one last round of applause. Thank you.